Okay, welcome back. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5. Feels good to be back in 1 Peter after the, the three weeks off with uh, all of the Easter activities. So this morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4, and then the next time we will finish 1 Peter and then move into 2 Peter. So we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And then we'll get into the, the message. We'll have the text up here for you if you don't <clears throat> have a Bible or um, just prefer to look up here. But First uh, Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for how it speaks to us about such an important thing, and that is the topic of church leaders, pastors, elders. And as we look at it, we trust that you will minister to us and teach us about the importance of this role, this office, this calling, and help us to understand it. Uh, Lord, maybe even you're speaking to some of us here this morning to take a step forward in such ways. And so we open our hearts to you and to what you might have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. My normal methodology is to just preach and teach right through the text. But I'm gonna, I am going to do that, but we're going to take a little excursion this morning at the beginning of our time together because of the importance of this passage and what it deals with. Throughout the New Testament, leadership is spoken of in, in, using different terminologies, and we're going to look at some of that. And we're going to see how much of that terminology is actually synonymous with one another. So I'm going to use some slides to sort of get us on the same page. And so if you could bring the, that first one up, please. And what I've done is as we work through these, uh, we're going to look at the, the Greek words that are mentioned in the passage. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those at this point in time, but since you probably don't work with languages like this, and I don't on a regular basis, but... Um, I do en enough, I'm, I'm always looking at the words, looking at the meanings behind the words, trying to understand, of course, what's happening. I had a, a semester of Greek, I should have had a year of Greek, but I didn't take the second semester. And, um, but it's, it's good to have under your belt. So we're going to read through several passages that talk about leadership, and I just want your eyes to get accustomed to seeing these words because you're going to see these words pop up and be very common as we get to come back to looking at the passage and what the significance is. So you can see here in the passage we just read, the word elders is presbyteros. That might sound familiar, Presbyterian. Uh, I am a fellow elder, some presbyteros, meaning uh, alongside of you. Uh, then he, the command is to shepherd the flock of God. The word shepherd is almost always a form of the word poimen or poimano. Serving as overseers, that word is almost always translated as episkopos. Um, not by compulsion, but willingly. And then he says, when the chief shepherd, Jesus, the archipoimen, you've heard of archangel, the chief angel, the, the first angel, the, the one over all the angels, Jesus is the archpoiment, and there's only one, the chief shepherd. So if we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Jesus, 
in the passage in John chapter 10 is the first one who talked about shepherds or pastors. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You can see the word poiment all the way through here, right? But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. The word hireling means one who's just hired for a wage. Hey, I need somebody to cut my grass. They don't care about your home. All they care about is the paycheck they're getting to cut your grass. Same thing for a hireling. A hireling would be someone, maybe the shepherd was sick and they called somebody in, but that, sh- that hireling is not a shepherd. He doesn't care for the sheep, and that's the idea here. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus obviously speaking of himself. Next slide. In John 21, you may remember, this is the last chapter in John, the last passage. And the apostle Peter, he wasn't an apostle at the time, but he was on his way to that, uh, had denied the Lord three times. And this is the point in which he meets Jesus and Jesus has a conversation with him to restore him to the place he had before he fell into the sin of denying Jesus. And so we want to walk through this as well. This this has importance for us because Peter wrote the passage that we are studying and no doubt this marked Peter as Jesus restored him to ministry. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, uh, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Pointing to the other men, most likely. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend Poimano, pastor, shepherd, my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now here's what's happening in this passage and and where the language makes uh, a real impact. When he says in verse 15, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Jesus used the word agape. Peter, do you agape me? Now, I don't know how you've heard the agape love of God described. Certainly, you can go and read 1 Corinthians 13, which we call the love chapter, and it is. But the simple definition I use is this, agape love, and this is the agape love of God, Agape love seeks only to give and never to get. The agape love of God seeks only to give and never to get. When you think about human love, is it that way? We get upset in our relationships because the other person is not loving us the way we want to be loved. And I tell you, that is the root source of marriage counseling, which is a million, billion dollar industry in this country. And how it could be fixed if we lived with the agape love of God. And that's the love spoken of in Ephesians 5, which is the great marriage chapter, but we'll get to that in a minute. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you agape me more than these? And when Peter replied, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but the word for love he used is phileo, philo, brotherly love. Jesus says, do you agape me, Peter? He says, yeah, Lord, you know I phileo. You're, You're a buddy. You're a friend. So you can see they're not on the same level. Peter can't accept what Jesus is saying, perhaps because of the guilt of his denial Verse 16, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. 
But both times, Jesus didn't get mad at him. He said, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend, to pastor, to shepherd my sheep. The third time in verse 17, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? That time, Jesus didn't say agape. He said, do you phileo me? Okay, Peter, I'll meet you where you are. You don't love me the way I love you. So I'm going to love you as a brother. And that's why Peter got grieved. Peter was grieved. Why? Because Jesus came down to his level because Peter couldn't, he couldn't rise to agape love. He could only deal with a friendship love in his heart. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you, phileo. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So this is not a conditional love that Jesus is extending to Peter, is it? It is a love that has vision, that sees purpose, that sees hope in somebody, that sees potential. So Jesus speaking of agape, Peter speaking of friendship. Next slide. In Acts chapter 20, this is interesting because Paul is now traveling back to Jerusalem before he's going to get arrested and go to prison. And he's having a meeting with the elders from the church in Ephesus. I have all this on PDF if you want it. You can take pictures, but if you want it, you can have all this, no problem. Um, and as Peter is speaking to them, remember Peter, excuse me, Paul spent uh, three years in Ephesus, the longest that he spent anywhere. And so he's now saying to them, just sort of giving them uh, uh, a pep talk, a speech, very similar to what Peter is doing here in 1 Peter chapter 5. And he says, Paul speaking to these elders, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. For the three years I was with you, I taught you the whole Bible. That's what he's saying. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, Episcopos, to shepherd, poimano, pastor, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Very important. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. That's a part of of their shepherding, their pastoring, is dealing with those kinds of problems in the church. Next slide. In Ephesians 1, we're not going to read through this whole passage, but the point here is Paul makes the statement again, and he, God, put all things under his feet, Jesus, and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. Important point for us to note. Next slide. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 is where Paul talks about the office, the offices that God gives to his church. And he gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, poimen, shepherds, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of, of Christ, so the work of the pastor teacher. Till we all come to, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So pastors, elders, shepherds have this charge to speak to the church, to build up the church, to encourage the church, and to be in it for the long haul, to prepare people for the day when we meet Jesus Christ. Again, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So reminding us again, whose church is this? The church belongs to no man. The church belongs to no pastor. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the head. Next slide. In the passage on marriage, notice what he says here. The husband's head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Why do these things keep coming up? Because we need to remember, you're not my people. No pastor can say it. You've been given into the charge of a pastor in a local congregation and, and the leadership there. But we don't own you. 
Jesus owns you. Our job is to be stewards of those whom he's given us in, into our charge. Christ is the head. He's the savior of the body. Husbands, love your wives just as, and the, this next part here is about Jesus. Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for her. Nobody else redeemed the church but Jesus. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Jesus is the word, John tells us. Jesus brought the word. He spoke the word. That he, this is his goal ultimately, might present her, the church, to himself. You get that? He's going to present the church one day to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He's saying he's going to present his bride to himself on that great day when we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So Jesus cares about his church. Jesus looks at his church as his bride. Jesus looks at his church as his inheritance. This is all very important for the poyman, the pastor, the shepherd, to have in his mind. Whose church is it? Next slide. In the two passages that talk about qualifications for leaders, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, here he says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, an episcopate, he desires a good work, a bishop, episcopos, the endings talk about slight differences, we'll get into that later. A bishop then must be blameless, and he goes through the character qualifications of the person who would rise to such occasion. Next slide. Titus. Uh, Titus, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders, presbyteros, different word, in every city as I commanded you. Verse 7, for a bishop, episcopos must be blameless as a steward. The reason I put that in there is a steward is one who is responsible to care for the things that the master puts in his charge. So in this case, the steward of a household would be over all of the things of the master's house. Best example, Joseph. When he was in prison in Egypt, before that, he was uh, brought into Potiphar's house, and he was given charge of everything in Potiphar's house. He was second in command. Potiphar would go away on trips. Joseph was in charge. He was the steward. So a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. Whose things are we stewarding? God's things. God's resources, God's money, God's people, his church. Next. Now, here we see elders in a different context. Where are the elders? They're around the throne of God, Revelation chapter 4. What are these elders doing? They're sitting on the throne. And when we went through the book of Revelation, we looked at this, 24 elders, most likely uh, the 12 heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But here, there's 24 thrones. I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white. They're sitting around the throne of God. And then this last part here, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, the presbyteros, fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Here's the why I, I, I brought this up. What are the elders doing? They're worshiping God. Where are their eyes? Their eyes are on Jesus, right? Next slide. Chapter 5, we see much the same thing. We see the elders come up all throughout chapter 5, but it's the same thing. They're around the throne. They're singing the song of the Lamb. They're worshiping God, and their eyes are transfixed on the throne of God. Catch the picture? Next slide. Here are those words. We'll run through the definitions and then I'm going to teach through the passage. Presbyteros means elder. It typically just means someone who's older, who's got life experience as a believer and, the, you know, senior, ripe in age and experience. And you want those kinds of people, right? People who have seen a lot of things. 
who know how to deal with problems, who don't fall apart when something blows up. You want those kinds of people. Peter mentioned himself, some presbyteros, I'm a fellow elder. Poimano, tend, shepherd, feed, care for, rule, govern, nourish, cherish. That's what the word means. Poimen, same word, different ending. Pastor, shepherd, one who cares for flocks, superintendent, guardian, overseer of a local church. Episcopeo, to look upon, to inspect, to oversee, to care for, to examine the state of affairs. Archipoimen, Jesus, the head shepherd, the chief shepherd. Episcopos, episcope, guardian, overseer, superintendent, office of overseer, elder, inspector, examiner. Why do we bring all this up? You can see that presbyteros, episcopeo, even poimen to an extent, there's very much synonyms. They very much get to the heart of what it means to be uh, as an elder, as a leader, and the reason I wanted to show you those verses is that they use the words interchangeably. Uh, Paul, writing to Timothy, used one word. Paul, writing to Titus, used two other words. So most commentators, most conservative scholars believe these are synonymous terms, but they speak of the importance of these roles of spiritual leadership, elders and pastors. The one exception, I think, is that Jesus, in the John 10 passage, says he's the good shepherd, and of course, he calls other shepherds. And then in the Ephesians 4 passage, where Paul talks about the four offices, you know, apostles, prophets, uh, uh, evangelists, and pastor teachers, uh, that's given as a particular office. So all of that to say this is the way God looks at church leadership. So the last slide is really our passage again. And now we're just going to work our way through this. So we're just going to leave this up there. But here's what Peter is saying here as an elder. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. So what is the exhortation? We're going to look at that. How does an elder carry out the exhortation? He talks about that right here. And what is the elder's motivation? in carrying out the exhortation. The elders who are among you, remember Peter's writing to the church scattered all up throughout the region of Turkey, scattered by persecution. So he's trying to encourage these. He's writing a general letter that's going out on a wide distribution. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I'm calling you alongside myself. I'm asking you to join me in this. I'm a fellow elder, I'm beside you. And he says, I'm a witness. The wit word witness is martyr. Martyr doesn't mean someone who died for Christ. The word martyr means someone who is a witness for Christ. We think of a martyr as those who have died. Certainly those who have died witnessing for Christ were, quote, martyred, meaning they died bearing witness. But Peter is saying I want you to stand with me in this, those of you who have this calling in this heart to serve the church in this way. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Remember during the crucifixion, all the disciples deserted him except John was standing there with the women? But we know Peter on the night that he was betraying Christ, remember John tells us, and the other Gospels tell us, but John gives us a good picture, as Peter was standing off at a distance, but he was watching the trial happening in these different places. And we aren't told that Peter wasn't necessarily there at the cross, but perhaps he was there at a distance. But Peter's now saying, as he's looking back, I was a witness, I was, I was a martyr of the sufferings of Jesus and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Many believe he's referring to his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that he saw the glory of God in Jesus in his shimmering white garments as, as the, the, the glory of God fell upon Christ. And of course, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets coming together. Remember, Peter was so enamored, and he was like, oh, let's build three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And so Peter saw these things and he's saying, I'm a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. 
And he knows now in hindsight looking back that what he saw there and witnessed on that day was as the old hymn says, just a foretaste of glory divine. Here's the exhortation. Shepherd, and that's a verb, poimano, the flock of God which is among you. Pastor that flock, elders, leaders. Shepherd the flock because God's put you over them and he's put them under you. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. And we talked about those different definitions there and certainly overseers were those who were there to protect the body and to oversee the affairs and make sure nothing funky is going on, the money's handled properly and people are being cared for, needs are being met, people are being encouraged in Christ. And as you do that, he says, not by compulsion. So he doesn't want the, those who are serving as overseers, and now he's getting into how they carry out the exhortation, not to do it under force or under constraint. Remember, the hireling in John 10 was the person who's doing it just because it's a job, it's money, it's paying the bills, but they don't really care about the sheep. And so the Holy Spirit here, as he's talking to us through this passage, and specifically to those who would fall in this category, are those who should do it not under compulsion, but willingly, voluntarily, of their own accord, with intention, with zeal, with a ready mind. That's what the word is saying. Now in the pa passage we read in 1 Timothy 3, I'll read the verse to you again, 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. There's two words there for desire. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, that word desire is a verb which means to stretch oneself out in order to touch or to grasp something. So what that's saying is that, that man is reaching out to serve God in this way. And I would say that God has put it in that person's heart to do so. So this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, if he's reaching out for it, if he's making an outward effort to reach out to serve God in such a way, and I would describe this as a holy ambition, not an ambition in the sense of someone who wants to reach a place, you know, go up the ladder, uh, be in a position of authority, that kind of a thing, but a holy ambition, then this person is a, is a man who's going to take the initiative to how can I serve God, how can I serve God's church in this way. The second word, so again, I'll read the verse. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires, outwardly stretching, reaching for the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The second word, desire, is a completely different word, and it means an inward, passionate longing. So there's the outward and the inward. And so this is what we look for in elders, in bishops, the people who have that inward and that outward desire to serve God in that way. What is all this saying? That that person has a heart for the church. They have a heart for God's flock, for the bride of Jesus Christ. It's a holy calling. It's a holy ambition. Now, in 1 Corinthians, the passage I'm going to read is not specifically talking about this, but it sort of gets to the idea. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is addressing the gifts of the Spirit and how they had been misused in the area of Corinth. But he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort or encouragement to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. The idea is this, that people who use their gifts want to use them in such a way to bring a blessing to the body of Christ. And so, in like manner, uh, this man who has this passionate longing to serve God in an oversight kind of a role has this desire to edify the church, to build up the church. 
So he says here in that verse, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Probably nothing has marred the church more than those in the prosperity doctrine who have done things for money. And who, in my opinion, I would use this term, have fleeced the flock for what the King James calls sordid gain. That it's all for money. And they're building an empire and a kingdom and they just want to use it as a way to build up themselves and build up their pockets. And he says, no, this man shouldn't be that way, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, literally a ready mind, heartily, willingly, cheerfully. This is the way this person is to be serving, not giving thought to how is he and his family going to get provided for, but just to throw yourself into the ministry. There's other things that talk about this. We could go off and do a whole study on how that happens. A true shepherd eagerly rejoices at the privilege to serve at all costs. Serving is a joy and an opportunity and a privilege. Serving is never a burden. This is what he's saying here. And then in verse 3, as he continues to say, how do you carry out this exhortation? Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This idea of being lords over, it means to control, to subjugate, to domineer over people, to control people, to keep them under your thumb. And again, this is something that has marred the church. We're spiritual leaders and we've, had, we've invented terms now, spiritual abuse. That's a term. Where leaders have done this to the flock of God. And he's saying here again, no, this is not a position of power and control over people. It's a position of serving people and building people and coming in from the underneath to support them and build them up in their faith, to lift them up toward heaven toward the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus himself addressed this many times with his disciples. Here's one passage, Matthew chapter 20. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus told his disciples that, and that's what Peter's saying here. See, this is what Jesus told us. This is how we are to be. And so we are to be like Jesus in that matter. We are to come and to lay down our lives for the flock. That's what he said in John 10. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, the pastors, the elders, they're not Jesus. They're not going to die for the sins of their flock. But they are to serve the flock, if need be, to that point, to that level. So that we can help... Pre present the church to Jesus one day, his bride, adorned, encouraged, nourished, built up, ready to be in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. One negative example of this, John the Apostle wrote in, it's called Third John, his third letter, and he spoke of this man named Diotrephes. And here's what he wrote, Third John chapter 1, verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, pratting against us. And that word pratting has sort of the idea of strutting. So think of an end zone dance in a football game. Pratting against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and he forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. This is a guy who has risen somehow to a place of authority and he's totally abusing the people of God. And John is saying, I've got to go deal with this guy. Who wants to deal with that mess? 
And then he says, those entrusted to you, and I would point out that this is, the idea is that God himself, the Holy Spirit, has entrusted people to the local congregations. You know, God has churches everywhere. He has pastors and leaders everywhere. And so he's saying, I've put people, just, you know, the Old Testament, the Psalms, it's a beautiful psalm that says, God puts people in their families. And in like manner, God puts people in churches. And, you know, sometimes people, you know, they kind of move around, right, looking for a, a church and leadership and the whole thing that they kind of can be a part of. And they're like, I can plug in and feel a part of this. Well, part of that is by design because it's God's heritage. God's people are God's heritage. And he has entrusted the people to the shepherds. Again, going back to Acts chapter 20 that we looked at earlier. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. And he said, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You see, this is not a role that you simply say, hey, I think I'd like to be over the people in the church. You know, God has to call you to it. He has to put this upon your heart. And as he put this in, put, puts this in the heart of these leaders, again, they, they desire it. They strive for it. They have the inward. They have the outward. They want to do it. They want to serve God in that way. And then he finishes up there by saying, but being examples to the flock. Now, in case there's any pride mixed in here, this is where it ought to get dissolved and washed away. An example. An example is a person who has been in, had an impress or a mark or a stamp. And the idea is marked by Jesus Christ the stamp, the impression of the, the person and the work and the character of Jesus upon this person's life. The word example could also mean a figure formed by a blow or an impression. If you've ever done any type of work with wood or with metal, sometimes you, you see a tool mark left there. Maybe you didn't mean to, but you did. And you see that mark, and that mark stays there. It's also interesting that it can mean a wound. How many of us here have scars from something that happened, a mishap? I've got them all over my body. A pattern of conformity, an example to be followed or imitated. Living a life worthy of being examined and followed, and this is the hardest part. Who wants their life to be lived in a glass house and to be examined. And yet that is exactly what he calls leaders to do. It's the hardest thing. And I'll be honest with you, I feel like such a failure working through this passage. Yesterday I came to tears looking at it like, God, why do you allow me? And then I remember Peter. Peter's writing this, the one who denied Jesus. And here's the thing, men. God's not looking for perfect servants. There are none. He's looking for those whose heart is willing to be subjugated to himself. And when the chief shepherd appears, here's our motivation. When the chief shepherd appears, Jesus himself, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What is he saying? The bonus at the end is far better than anything you could ever receive along the way. Whenever anybody says, hey, you know, great sermon, you know, whatever, that's great. But you know what we live for? And it's the same thing that all of us as believers are encouraged to live for, seeing Jesus. That's what we live for. And what he's saying here to these servants, to these elders, bishops, pastors, is this. Your payment is to be in the presence of Jesus. And like all of us desire to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. What is our motivation? One day he shall appear, he shall be made visible, and he's going to have a crown of glory that does not fade away. And he wants us to know Remember, he's coming, and he's going to demand an account from his shepherds. How did you care for my bride? How did you care 
for my church. Little children, abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed at him before his coming. Beloved, now we're the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him just as he is. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul writing to Timothy, I want you to keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. Finally, there's laid up for me, Paul wrote, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, capital D, the day I meet him. And not to me only, but also to all who has lo have loved his appearing. And here's the final exhortation from Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is to be the heart of every believer, but especially the heart of a pastor, an elder, an overseer, a church leader. When we have our board meetings, I make it a point that we start with a prayer that goes something like this, God help us as we administrate your affairs and we talk about and oversee the matters happening in your church because one day we will present this church to you as a bride. These people, these things are not our own. They don't belong to us, and as such, we need your help. We need your wisdom. That very much is the prayer and the spirit which we bring into our times of talking about what's happening and what needs to happen and all of that. So I feel compelled as we close out this teaching to say to you today, please forgive me for not living up to this high and holy calling. May God be merciful to me and to you, to all of us as sinners. And may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him has endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of God. And I don't know about you, but I long for the day to be with him and to be free of my sin. And the things that bind and so easily constrain me as a human being. And the things that keep me from being all that I can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as one person to another. And I hope and I pray that for you, that whether it's me or someone else, that God will love you and care for you and teach you and build you up and feed you and nurture you until the day that you either die or you meet him in the air. Because we want to, as he said in the book of Colossians, we long to present every man complete in Christ. And that's our goal. So thank you for letting us serve you, Pastor Mitch, myself, Steve, others. We love you. I wish we could show it in a more demonstrable way. But what we do is not for ourselves. It's for Jesus. And if you gain anything, here's what you should gain, that Jesus loves you because we want him to love you through us. Don't look at us. Don't put leaders on a pedestal. You will always be disappointed if you do that. We are men. We will fail. We do fail. But look to Jesus. Our job is to help you see Jesus. Our job is to lead you to Jesus. He is the only one worthy of your praise, of your attention. Look to Jesus, 
and you will never be disappointed. Look to men, and you will be disappointed. I pray that I never let you down, but if I do, you'll know it was me, it was my flesh, it was the wickedness of my sin. But God's call, his charge here is to care for his sheep, and so that's a charge we willingly accept. It comes with great responsibility, but all I can tell you is it's just, it's a gift, it's something that he's given us. And so thank you for entrusting yourselves to us, and I pray that we don't disappoint. God, uh, most of all, we don't want to disappoint you. And so, Lord, help us as, as people, whether it's this church or any other church. Lord, I pray here today, not just for me and those of us here who serve in leadership, but for your shepherds and your servants everywhere. This is a high and a holy calling, one that we we hold with great respect and great reverence. And Lord, this is not our church to do with as we see fit. It is your church, your bride, and your word tells us how you want your bride to be loved and nurtured and cared for. And I pray that we would be faithful and true to that calling. God help us. We love you, Lord. And may we love you until the end, whenever that is. And we pray that one day as we stand before your presence, that we'll be able to stand there knowing that you gave us godly, faithful leaders along the way in our lives. And there are so many in my life. And I know I stand here because of them. I stand on their shoulders because of your faithfulness to me and your faithfulness to us. So God, we love you. We bless you. May the name of the Lord be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.